opening prayer this evening. We'll sing number 345. Number 345, we'll sing all four verses of this song. gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this time that we have been able to come together with our church family and worship you and encourage one another that we may face the weak and remain strong and be an influence on those around us. Dear God, we're thankful for this church at West Main and the influence that it has had on those around us, the community around us. We pray that we will have an even greater influence on those that we meet and have interaction with, that we will continue to grow. We're so thankful for our leaders, our elders, 
and the decisions that they make for each and every one of us. We're thankful for the work that the deacons do. Dear God, we are blessed with Chelsea and Nathan and Vicki and Doug who work with us each and every week. We're thankful for the work that they do and the godly lives that they leave. They're their influence that they have on each and every one of us. Dear God, we ask that you be with our country. It has many issues going on. We pray that these leaders will learn to look to you for guidance and that Things may improve. We ask that you be with those that are serving our country on foreign soil. Keep them safe and bring them back to us. We ask prayer for those that are in mission fields, whether it be abroad or in the States. Help us to be an encouragement to them and give them the strength that they need to do your work and your will. Dear God, we ask that you be with those among us who are sick. We ask that you heal them if it be your will. And we ask that you be with those that have recently lost loved ones. Comfort them, dear God, and help us to be an encouragement to them as well. We ask that you would be with our young people as they are faced with many challenges, some challenges that we've, we who are older have not had to experience. Dear God, help them to look to you for strength that they may get through those challenges and that they may be an encouragement to those that are around them. Dear God, we pray for our new preacher and his wife, Carrie and Lenore, that will be coming to us in the next few months. We ask that you be with them and help them to be a good fit for our congregation. And we're so thankful that Doug and Vicki will stay and worship with us. Dear God, we thank you for all the many, many blessings that you give us each and every day. You take care of our every need and everything that we have, we know is yours and it is simply on loan to us. Help us to be good stewards of those things that we have. Forgive us when we fail, dear God. In his name we pray, amen. If you'd like to mark the invitation song, we will sing number 197. Once again, our invitation song will be number 197. And after you have that marked, if you'll turn over to number 234, sing this before our lesson this evening, number 234, sing the first, second, and fourth verse. If it's convenient and you're able, would you please stand as we worship together.
Scripture reading tonight will be Psalms 139, verses 14 through 18. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. We continue in our study through the one word devotional book and we're behind but I keep saying that so I may as well quit saying it till we catch up but we're behind but we're looking tonight at the subject of worry and then we look at the subject of suffering and then shame and one of these days we'll be somewhere close to current. Worry must be one of those universal emotions and conditions that I think all of us deal with. According to statistics, stress.org 2017, the most common sources of stress, 63% say they worry about the future of our nation, 62% worry about money, 61% work, 57% the political climate, 51% violence and crime. In a 2018 Gallup poll, about 45% of people surveyed said they worried a lot. And in the last 30 or so years, there's been a, um, a popular phrase that has come into the counseling field, the psychology field, called generalized anxiety disorder. And that is that you're just all stressed out and you're just on pins and needles and, and easily upset and you don't really even know why. And somewhere between 6 and 12 percent of people are going to have a diagnosable episode of generalized anxiety disorder in their lifetime and about half get treatment. So I would urge you if you are excessively obsessive about worry or victimized by anxiety, among other things, not necessarily the most important thing, but it is important that you talk to your medical professional. And by the way, 91% of worries held by people with generalized anxiety disorder did not come true. Think about that for a while. Nine out of 10 things they were worried about never happen. It's the fear of the unknown, it's the unpredictability of life, it's unmet, unrealistic expectations. Worry is one of those issues that if you have a pulse, you're dealing with it. And that means that statues and robots and non-humans and anything else that isn't alive doesn't have to deal with worry, but we do. It's, characteristic of humanity. We're fortunate that we serve a Lord who lived life just like you and I have to. And though I believe life is a bit more complicated today than it was 2,000 or even three or 4,000 years ago, I don't believe people have changed all that much. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, my Bible says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So it would appear to be prudent for us to see what Jesus said about worry and apply that to our lives because he is sympathetic to us. And so what does the Bible say? In Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 22, it's hard to misunderstand this plain language. Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens who neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of much more value are you than the birds. 
And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you so anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God then so clothes the grass of the field, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. Here's here's the Lord's advice, but seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms, provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When I read that passage and when I think about worry, I certainly, uh, I'm I'm okay with the part about don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. I've never done without food for very long and unless it was on purpose, and I certainly never worried about having clothes to wear. But for some of us, uh, our worries go a lot deeper and are a lot more complicated than that. But in verse 22, it is hard to misunderstand Jesus when he says, do not worry about your life. I can remember 35 years ago, maybe, maybe 40, I was um, leaving my hometown to come home and as always happens uh, when I left, mother would get a little teary and she would say, now you call me when you get home. Do you have a mother like that? So I'll know you made it all right. And I said, mother, how about I call you if I'm in trouble? She said, that'd be fine, but call me when you get home so I'll know that you made it all right. And I didn't really get that at the time. I'm beginning to understand that better than I ever have. Car accidents or being injured or not being able to pay for your treatment after an accident, those are things people worry about. Aging ungracefully, being saddled with some kind of a difficult diagnosis medically, relationship issues, losing a job and not being able to find another one is a fear that debilitates many. Terrorism or biological attack, this fear still affects us. Sexual predators or other evil characters hurting our children or grandchildren, this is cause for legitimate concern. And that's a half a dozen things. You could add to that list, but probably some of you are saying, thanks for those six things I have now to worry about I hadn't thought of. I'll just add that to my list. And for some reason, life seems so much more complicated than how Jesus describes it in Luke chapter 12. But in the true sense of the word, I don't believe life is all that different are all that more complicated. In some ways I can understand that, but I'm not gonna accept that label. Jesus was attempting to teach the people about worry and he used examples with which they were the most familiar and with which they struggled on a daily basis. He used food. He mentions clothing. He mentions worries of the body. The examples that he used are not the point. The examples are only examples that people in that time could relate to. And whether you and I can relate to those or not, we can substitute our own. And he still says, do not worry. What you and I need to focus on in the midst of changing times are the unchangeable things. And this is when it's so valuable to have a relationship with God. This is when it's so valuable to have a support system of God's people in place before the bottom falls out. 
And we take a look at this passage and we strip away the examples Jesus is trying to make and and not too many of us have thought much about the ravens lately but probably we have thought about moths and rust at least things don't seem to last and I believe that when we study Luke chapter 12 22 through 34 we're left with three main principles that apply to our lives no matter what it is you're worrying about. And I believe these three things will help us. Principle number one is that worry subtracts from our life. Verses 25 and 26, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? I can imagine the people literally doing the math in their head and say, man, I'd like to add a year to my life. I'd like to add a decade to my life. And for exaggeration and emphasis sake, Jesus said, with all your worrying, will that even add a single hour to your life and he says no. Let's just take a little suppose journey and suppose you're walking through life at five miles an hour towards eternity which is about for you 30 years away. And you're worried about someone in your family getting cancer so you begin to worry and cry and have stress and if you don't like the cancer worry then insert some other kind of worry that you have found yourself worrying about. And here is the math problem. Jesus said, when you insert things like that into your daily routine, what have you added to your life? And his comment is answering the question, what have you gained? What benefit has worry brought into your life? And Jesus' answer is that by worrying, we have added nothing, we have gained nothing in our lives, but have really only subtracted from our lives. Worry is the enemy of faith. I'm going to say that again. Worry is the enemy of faith. Now, faith has a lot of enemies, but I believe the one that most of us experience most often since we're here tonight have some measure of strength as a Christian is that of worry. In Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 7 and 8, my Bible reads, But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream, it does not fear when heat comes, its leaves are always green, it has no worries in a year of drought, and never fails to bear fruit. Some of us are not like that tree planted by the water that sends its roots out deep to the stream. And we don't do that well when the heat comes and when times are hard. In Luke chapter 10, the Bible says a friend of Jesus by the name of Martha was worried and upset about many things, verse 41. And the reason is she had neglected to enjoy the presence of Jesus. And she was neglecting her faith side. She wasn't feeding her faith because she was too worried about feeding her faith. And Jesus compliments Mary's activities over Martha, and again, because worry subtracts from our lives. Worry subtracts peace and assurance that God will take care of us. Worry subtracts hours of sleep and health and can cause varying physical heart issues. Worry subtracts from your muscles and causes aches and pains, those back aches, stomach aches, headaches. Worry subtracts from your thought life and can cause memory loss and lead to depression. Worry subtracts from your relationships because it can spread 
and it affects others. It overflows and it can become frustrating to others. And so we're not just talking about medical opinion, though I cite in your manuscript several references to WebMD on the effects of worry. But all through the Bible, this particular admonition against worry is repeated. In the Old Testament, in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 25, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. Are you and I too busy to give someone a kind word? Just a simple smile, the smallest good deed, a note of encouragement, the benefit of the doubt. In Luke chapter 21 and verse 34, Jesus tells us, Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, watch it, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. Worry is in pretty bad company there in the words of Jesus. Worry is a trap that subtracts from our lives and weighs us down. As Jesus taught his disciples in the crowds in his day, just remember this one fact, worry subtracts. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Number two, principle two, not only does worry subtract from our life, but God knows, seek him, verses 30 through 32. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. Do you have bills to pay? Your father knows that. Do you have health concerns? Your father knows that. Are you worried about your family? Your father knows that. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sooner or later, the Christian is going to be ushered into an eternal, worry-free existence. And I believe that the promise of that can be experienced in a, on a limited basis, even in the here and now, if we keep our faith strong. So worry subtracts. God knows. He's watching everything we do. And instead of being threatened by that, we ought to be comforted by that. Hebrews 4 and verse 13 tells us nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. He knows our needs even before we realize them. If we're worried about our job or an evaluation coming up, God knows that. We need to seek him. We need to spend quiet time with the Lord. We need to be praying. We need to have other people pray. Are you worried about the results of a medical test coming up or a surgery that you must have? God knows. Seek him. Are you worried about the safety of your children or your grandchildren? God knows. Seek him. No matter what issue we face or no matter what we think, God doesn't notice because there's so many people in the world and he's so occupied in all these different places, we are simply wrong if we think that God does not know how I feel. In Psalm 139, verses 23 and 4, the psalmist said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I think that psalm reflects a commonly held idea back in Bible times and even today for that matter that a lot of times people reap what they sow or as we might say in more common language get what they deserve. And that's not always the case. There's going to be a payday someday, and I don't want what I deserve on that payday, but that's another story for another time. 
But I do need to look at the troublesome situations in which I find myself, and as the psalmist said, see if there is any offensive way in me. Is there something I have done to contribute to the concern that I have about this situation? How have I contributed to this anxiety? In Psalm 139, King David prays that God would find the anxious thoughts and remove them. And that brings us to the third principle that we have, worry subtracts. God knows, and principle number three, we need to mind our heart. Verse 33 and four, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we need to have an eternal perspective. This is probably the best advice I can give you to take home tonight, that whatever is going on, no matter how bad it is, it won't last very long. And somebody said, well, how do we do that? How do we have an eternal perspective in our hearts? First of all, I think we just make up our mind ahead of time, no matter what, I'm going to trust God. That's my greatest resource. It's the only resource worth keeping. In Psalm 94, 17 and following, unless the Lord had given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said, my foot is slipping, your love, O Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. We may feel like the silence of death is something that we even long for, but it's, it's not our time to be in that stage of life just yet, and the last stage of life is death. And if the Lord tarries, we need to use whatever time we have left to his glory. And if we have our faith as it should be, where it should be, though it's not easy, it will be possible to live a worry-free existence more than ever before. And I add that last part because some by their genetic code seem to be pre-programmed to be worriers. Some, that's the environment like myself that we grew up in. Probably the most um, important thing that I'll say is that deciding Making up our minds to trust in God is a constant decision. It has to be made and remade. It has to be affirmed and reaffirmed that God will direct our hearts and we will let his joy reign in our heart and his power work in our life. And that is how people of faith rise above circumstances that would cripple most others. So trust in God. Secondly, we have to be people of prayer. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, if you were paying attention, notice that the promise of Philippians chapter 4 is the same promise as we just read from Psalm 94. And that is, when we make up our mind to trust God and allow Him to change us and we come to Him in prayer, God fills our heart with joy and peace and a certain understanding that's not available any other way. Thirdly, we must add the willingness to constantly come to God in the midst of worry. In spite of all of our resolutions and promises, in spite of having a strong support system, in spite of our prayers, we may be people who perpetually battle anxieties and worry. There may be some people who can make up their mind about this issue and it may be a one-time 
decision. And then from then on, every time you find yourself headed towards worry, then you remind yourself you've already decided how to handle that. But the rest of us are not less Christians because this is an issue that we have to address over and over again. The devil is waiting to be allowed by God to throw temptations to worry our way. I think he has a list and I think he's just waiting. And he and his people do very good, bad work. We'll close in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up. Now watch it. In due time, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Don't let worry kill you. The sign said out in front of one church building and then it said the subtitle was let the church help. Now go think about that one. But hopefully we will and prayerfully we will help one another. The biggest worry that you ought to have is your sin worry. And if that worry has been taken care of, then you are indeed a blessed individual above all others. And we stand ready tonight to assist you in becoming a Christian as you're baptized in the Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you need the prayers of this church for concerns in your life that you can't seem to shake, use your support system. Whether you do that privately or in a small group setting in your Bible class or your kit team or with just a few close friends or whether you want the whole church praying for you, this is your opportunity. As we stand and sing, we invite you to come. Thank you, Doug, for another excellent lesson. It's been great to see everyone here worshiping this evening. We read a number of announcements this morning. There are uh, several listed in your bulletin, but I would like to amend those tonight. First of all, if you would amend your, your prayer list, Samantha Cox's mother, Sherry Pittman, is in the North Mississippi Medical Sister Center with intestinal issues. Uh, they do covet your prayers, however, please no visitors at this time. Also, the Lee County Jail is holding a jail certification class on Thursday, December the 5th at 6.30 p.m. This is at Harrisburg Church. 
If any ladies are interested in joining the West Main teaching team, you must come to this class. Also, if any men are interested in starting a jail ministry, this would be the place for you to come and get more information, and this certification is also mandatory. Also, uh, allow me to remind you again that we will be hosting the area-wide youth devotional next Sunday uh, evening, and those evening services will start at 5 p.m. So please note, note of that, 5 p.m. Uh, in conjunction with this, there will be no pew packers. And, and also, kit team number one, you will meet next Sunday after morning services in the library to pass out cards. We read a number of cards this morning, those being from uh, Jerry and uh, Jean Enos, from uh, John and Susan Mooney, from Brian and Hope Pittman, and also from Pat Robertson. Let's be sure to continue to remember these families in our prayers. If you did not have the opportunity to take of the Lord's Supper, it has been left prepared in the library. If you will exit during the closing song, someone will be there to serve you. We invite everyone back for a Wednesday night devotional. We'll have a closing song and prayer. Number 684, we'll sing this before our closing prayer. If you would, please stand. <clears throat> Number 684, we'll sing the first and third verse of the song. This world does not Father, we're again so thankful for everything that you do for us. Let us always remember to take our worries to you and to ask thee to help us and to become better Christians as we labor with you. As we dismiss, we ask thee to be with us, especially for the ones that are traveling over this busy holiday week. Be with us, forgive us when we fail you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.